you and welcome to our webinar today, Using Effective Safety Training Methodologies and Incentivizing Safe Work Behaviors. We're so glad that you could join us here at CA Short and the National Association of Safety Professionals. This is what we're going to be discussing today. We've got several exciting topics to share with you on lots of different subjects. And we're gonna be going through these today at a pretty good pace. But I do wanna let you know that you're welcome to send questions over the chat pane if you'd like, or hold some until the end. We'll be uh, getting those together throughout the show. And then we'll be doing some questioning answering at the end of the presentation. So let's introduce our speakers now. We've got two great speakers for you today. One being Eric Gislason. He is the executive director of the National Association of Safety Professionals, and he's partnered today with Brent Lee, and Brent is a national account manager for the CA Short Company. So without further ado, and to get us started, let me turn things over to Eric. Hey folks, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you, and uh, Wanted to just start out by saying, I've been doing the safety training, gosh, for over 30 years. And what I find is that that's still probably one of the most difficult aspects of being a safety manager is really robust, effective safety training. Uh, you know, when you think about it, we've got a lot of obstacles as safety trainers, right? You think about the aspect of, is safety training looked at as a, exciting and engaging topic? Typically not. I mean, let's face it, uh, OSHA compliance training is not the most exciting topic in the world. I, I could be the first to admit that and understand that from a employee's perspective. You also look at uh, some of us just naturally maybe are not great safety trainers. And I'll tell you, it's like anything else. It's something that you're going to have to practice and get better at to be a more effective safety trainer. Uh, some people are just afraid of speaking in public, right? Public speaking ranks number two right behind death as a fear of people in general. So uh, standing in front of a group of people may not be comfortable for some people. Uh, we teach a lot of train the trainer courses in my field, and uh, we have students that are petrified to do training uh, even after they've been in front of a group all week long and have made friends and are peers. So there's a lot of obstacles. And then, you, and then you look at the students that just don't wanna be there, right? They, they, again, they look at uh, safety training as necessary evil. But folks, when you think about what we are doing, the type of training that we're doing, where we're talking about life or death situations or loss of limb or preventable illness, uh, these are the types of things that uh, will send a person back to their family or not, or uh, make sure that people are safe in the workplace. Uh, if somebody's falling asleep in your class, uh, that that's a, a real issue. So if our ultimate goal is to really change the perspective and hopefully the behavior of people as it pertains to safety, uh, I think this is a very important topic. And that's what I'm going to try to impress upon you guys today is some tools and resources that you can take back uh, to your facility, uh, and as well as why it's important to incentivize uh, student participation. So to start off, let's talk about the concept of andragogy versus pedagogy. So those are just fancy terms for training adults versus training children. Andros meaning adults and peda meaning children. And if you think about it, uh, we make the mistake that we kind of train our employees the way we were trained growing up, and that's really not effective. Now, I'm not going to get into the, the details of this because we don't have time in this webinar, but uh, there was a guy named Malcolm Knowles back in 1980 that wrote a book entirely about the concept of training adults versus training children, and he had a lot of really key points about why it's different, why the learner is different, what their experience is, and that sort of thing. So I know there's a lot on this particular slide. And normally in a classroom like this, we break this up into groups and we talk about each one of these and pretty uh, have very robust conversation about it. But to give you the Reader's Digest version, if you think about it in the left-hand column, look at the learner, right? 
as a child, you're dependent on the instructor and the teacher's responsible for what's taught. Think about adults, right? We have this need to be self-directed. We wanna be responsible for our own learning. We look at the role of the learner's experience. Typically children don't have a lot of experience, okay? With adults, we bring a lot of experience. Our students bring a lot of experience to the table. So we want to draw from that experience in the classroom. We want to use their knowledge. We don't want to be the, the guru and just have them sit and, and soak up the information. So there's a lot that we can learn from the role of the learner's experience. And then think about the readiness to learn. You know, students are basically told you have to do this to go to the next grade. However, in adults, change, right? Change is likely to trigger a readiness to learn. And look at that second sentence on the third column. The need to know in order to perform more effectively in some aspect of one's life is important, okay? I think that's a huge point to make. And orientation to training, right? Learning as a process of acquiring prescribed subject matter content units or sequence according to the logic of the subject matter. Okay, that's children. With adults, we want to perform a task, solve a problem, live a more satisfying way. In other words, think about how you introduce your training. Are you going to introduce your training as, you know, OSHA compliance is important because we don't want OSHA fines? I'm going to tell you that most employees probably don't care about that. Uh, most employees have the WIFM philosophy. Are you guys familiar with W-I-I-F-M, WIFM? What's in it for me? How is this going to help me? How is this going to make my job easier? Nobody wants to say safety training or safety implementation practice make it easier, but it can under certain circumstances. So that's the types of things we look for. And then, of course, motivation, right? Motivation for grades with children is that, hey, I get an A and I get to go to the next level. But with adults, we have internal motivators, self-esteem, recognition. People love to be recognized, especially during safety training. So there's a lot to this, folks, but that's kind of a cursory outline of the concept between the difference between pedagogy and andragogy. So you kind of get rid of that whole pedagogical style of training where you as the trainer are kind of the, the guru, the oracle, the omniscient, the know-it-all, right? And you basically take that role and turn it into more of a facilitation where you're getting input from the students. Because I'm going to tell you folks, if you don't learn from your students in these classes, uh, then you're missing a real a golden opportunity for uh, improvement, for continuous improvement. Because I'm going to tell you, your students are going to tell you all of the things that are going on in the facility that you might not be aware of that you can take that information and improve upon it. And that's the, that's the concept of andragogy, right? Andragogy is the concept of working in a team approach, uh, team problem solving. Even the, the literally the setup of your classroom, if you're still lining up your classrooms in a traditional, you know, one table with, uh, one person at a table in a classroom style format like that. That's not how andragogy works. Andragogy works where we bring them into a team approach. And literally we're talking about, you know, U-shaped configurations or uh, using round tables where they have interaction across from each other, amongst each other. So there's a lot to just the actual classroom setup to provide more effective training methodologies. I like this slide. Think about it. Education, education is not the filling of a bucket, but the lighting of a fire. Now, education and training kind of fall into that same category. You guys do understand the, the concept, the difference between education and training. Education is more the, the abstract concepts of it, while training is the hands-on, practical, tactile approach to it. But regardless, the education is trying to change behavior, right? The lighting of a fire under these individuals. You think about the, the concept that we could have a 100% perfectly safe work environment from an OSHA compliance perspective, right? 
everything from an OSHA compliance perspective is in order. We've got our plans and programs. We have our training. Uh, we have all of our guards on our equipment. We have good housekeeping. And yet we would still have 80% of the injuries, 80 to 90, some statistics say 90%, because of our people and our people with their at-risk behaviors. And what causes those at-risk behaviors? Well, I mean, if you think about it, you're talking about states of mind like complacency or distraction or fatigue or rushing. And your opportunity as a safety trainer to get in front of these people to hammer in that concept that we don't want you guys to be doing these types of things. We want you to focus on the safety. We want safety to be of value and not a priority that changes with production and quality improvements and things like that. Uh, your safety training, instead of teaching on just lockout tag out, you're gonna teach on why lockout's important, what the elements of it are, and why we hurt ourselves when we get in a hurry. Very quickly, I'll give you a, a quick uh, illustration of that point. And I'm not proud of this story, but I think it illustrates this point greatly. Uh, about 10 years ago, I, I was doing lockout tagout training. I had 120 maintenance people and we were doing our annual refresher and it was, it was cursory at best. And I'm not gonna lie, I had to just try to get through it. It was about an hour's worth of training on the standard, what they should do, what they shouldn't do. And I was gonna allow the supervisors to do the practical where they went out and did lock, tag and try. So they went through my training class and well, about three days later, one of the maintenance men actually removed a shroud off of a pipe threader and it pulled his thumb into the pipe threader and just completely mangled his thumb. Uh, even after reconstructive surgery, he basically had no thumb left. And, you know, the, the individual's terminated. You know, we can't always be that person that tells them not to do what they shouldn't do, but that person was terminated and uh, he went to drinking and he lost his marriage and uh, it was a very bad situation. And then I look at and I reflect on myself as a trainer and I think to myself, was my training effective? I trained them and three days later, he goes out and does something to that effect. Whether I can control 100% of what people do or not, it definitely gives you pause and reason to reflect. And that's the goal of our safety training is to change behavior. I can't emphasize that enough. So let's talk about the different types of trainers. Now, typically there's three different types of trainers. There is what we call a true facilitator. Now that's an individual who encourages, who motivates and coaches. Doesn't mean that these other two types of training don't do that too, but in true facilitation, what you're trying to do is allow your students or your employees to do the problem solving themselves. You give them a problem and they solve it themselves. So in other words, instead of going over a lockout tagout standard, you say, we've got this new piece of equipment. You guys write the, the lockout tagout procedures for it. And then we'll kind of go over it as a group and see where we miss, see what we could do better and, and make improvements from that. That's true facilitation, it's problem solving, it's getting employee participation. It's an excellent, it's probably the best way to do training. However, that being said, there is two and three, participatory lecture and non-participatory lecture. Now a participatory lecture, I do a lot of it. Participatory lecture means you're training on a particular topic, however, you are still getting the students involved. In other words, you might be asking questions, uh, asking for specific information on a particular topic. Uh, I think a really good method is if you've got people who are very familiar with a particular topic, have them do part of the presentation. Uh, I can't be an expert in every field and I never claim to be. I, I look at myself as a generalist. So if I've got a specialist in a particular area, then that, I'm gonna use that employee's knowledge. So participatory lecture, brings them into the fold, and maybe it's through reinforcement exercises. It's doing uh, an exercise after you've gone over topic to make sure that they understand the material. That's participatory lecture, okay? Then you've got non-participatory lecture. 
Now, I know there's a negative connotation there with information dumping. Sometimes that's all the time we have. So information dumping in non-participatory fashion may be, hey, we're going to have a toolbox talks and I've got a sheet of information with uh, 10 topics on it or 10 points of what to do or not to do while you're on this site. Maybe it's a maybe it's a construction site, maybe it's a new project, and it's just a reinforcement tool. We go over the stuff very quickly, they sign off, you move on, okay? Not the best way to do it, not the most preferred means to do it, but that is another type or style of training. So just out of curiosity, I'm gonna pop up a poll, and again, no judgment here, but uh, Renee, if you could go with the poll, I'm just kind of gonna see who, what type of style of training that you guys typically employ at your facility? If you guys can go ahead and click on that, just to kind of give me an idea of what we're doing. We'll give you a few seconds to respond. We're going to try that again. It looks like we were having some difficulties with that. Let's see if that works. And you guys feel free to give me feedback. Great, that looks like it's working for us. Now, Renee, I didn't actually see the poll results uh, myself. There we are. Okay, so it looks like the vast majority of you guys are doing uh, participatory lecture, which is, is effective. And then about 17% of you are doing non-participatory, which, which can work too. And facilitators, folks, those of you guys that are doing facilitation, uh, I think that's great. That's about 23% of you. Excellent, excellent. So let's keep moving. Now, Guys, what I like on this is we've been preaching adult training methodologies uh, at my company for over 20 years. What I like is that there are organizations out there that are finally starting to see the importance of actually doing uh, training methodologies, right? So <clears throat> you look at the ANSI ASSP standard, Z490.1. This is one of those recommended guidelines, right? Recommended guidelines for EHS trainers. And in those guidelines, they point out some very specific things like that you should be a subject matter expert and, and look at the second part of that first box, have the training delivery skills, right? Second box, of course you need to have appropriate technical knowledge, skills and abilities in the topics, okay? But you need to have the skills to impart that competency on your students. And I'm gonna tell you, this is an area that I see that, that would require vast improvements from some of the safety training uh, courses that I've audited before. And what I'm talking about, if you're imparting the knowledge, skills and abilities to a student, what that's saying is that they have the ability to do that job safely without getting hurt on the job. And <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I've seen some of the tests that some of the safety trainers provide to determine competency. In other words, I'm going to teach a class on lockout tag out, and then I'm going to give you a 10 question test on lockout tag out that proves your competency. And I've seen some of these test questions. Number one, lockout tag out is required with uh, maintenance and uh, repairs of equipment, true or false. Uh, okay, true. Number two, 
lockout tag out, uh, improper lockout tag out can cause electrocution or you know, something like that, true or false. Folks, that is not imparting knowledge. That is checking a box and putting a piece of paper on file that says that, that we've met some bare minimum requirements. Remember, OSHA is the bare minimum. So as a safety trainer, we need to have proper documentation that we've imparted that knowledge. And that's through the use of really good testing. Okay. And maybe it's not just a written test. Some of these standards required practical training like lockout tag out. So you'd have a test showing psychomotor skills. In other words, that we actually went out on piece of equipment XYZ and did what we were supposed to do. Okay. Uh, can be your best friend or worst enemy in a court of law or when an OSHA compliance person comes around to your facility. Then look at uh, box three, competent in techniques and methods appropriate to adult learning. All right. They're emphasizing the fact that you should employ adult training methodologies, which we're going to continue to cover. And then, of course, continuing education, development programs, experience, et cetera. And again, not to reemphasize, look at the last one, a apply adult learning principles appropriate to the target audience. I think these are very, very important. And this is an actual standard that, that focuses, that emphasizes these aspects. So I like it. Now, it's difficult to train because we have lots of different people in our workforce that have different styles of learning right? Uh, there's a mnemonic device, you call it BARC, and believe it or not, you can go online and get these BARC tests, which will tell you what type of training is most appropriate for a particular audience, because some people are visual learners, all right? Those are the people that maybe it's a picture or a diagram or something like that. Think about if you were putting a table together, right? If you had a diagram that helps you do that, Maybe that's the best way you learn is through the use of a diagram. What about auditory? Maybe I'm going to listen to somebody talk me through how to put a table together. So I'm an auditory. Uh, lecture and discussion works real well for auditory learners. All right. Then reading or writing. Maybe I have directions on how to put that table together. I read or write to put that table together. I read the directions. I take notes. Maybe you read from a textbook that type of thing. And then finally, kinesthetic learners, that's a fancy name for learning through doing, right? Learning through uh, hands-on, tactile, getting your hands on it. So instead of reading or seeing a diagram, maybe you just start putting that table together or you're having somebody walk you through putting that table together. They're with you right there and you guys work together to put the table together, okay? so. It doesn't mean you're all or one type. Typically people are uh, multimodal in their approach, but typically people have a preference to the type of learning that they want to employ. So it's difficult for us as trainers to hit all of these buttons. So that's a thing that we have to look at. And maybe we do some of this BART testing to see. I can tell you that just through experience, uh, surprisingly, many people check the auditory. They learn best by listening. But I can tell you that the vast majority of people that I deal with, especially if we're talking safety training, learn best by doing. All right. That's just anecdotally. That's what I've seen in my times. So what about you guys? Let's do another quick poll here. Uh, what kind of learner are you? I'm just curious. Again, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, Renee, if you can just throw that up on the board and hopefully we'll uh, get us get some feedback on that. Very interesting. So a lot of you guys are visual, thirty seven percent auditory only seven, reading or writing, writing 14, and then kinesthetic 42. I'm, I'm not shocked about the kinesthetic learning, but I was a little surprised that some of you guys said visual. Very interesting. So 
we know our issues, right? We know our issues. And now we got to apply the principles of participatory learning. And if you look at this pyramid of retention rate, my gosh, if just pure lecture, you're going to only retain 5% of what you learn versus reading, audiovisual, through demonstration. Those are traditional passive ways of learning. And then you get up to active learning, like through a discussion group, like what I've been talking about. We practice by doing. We teach others. Look at that. You start teaching somebody. That's why I like having students teach in my class, because you retain information uh, up to 90% based on the fact that you have to teach people information. So what type of, uh, what type of participatory principles are there? So, whoops. I jumped ahead of myself. I apologize. Let me see if I can get that back. Okay. Think about icebreakers. Okay. Icebreakers just, it's a way to introduce a topic in a fun, typically way, typical way. You guys have seen the, the video fails, that type of thing. We don't want to make safety a joke, but that's kind of a fun way to get the topic kicked off. There's lots of different stuff for icebreakers, uh, appropriate jokes, but you know how we have to be appropriate these days. So you got to be careful with that. Uh, number two, case studies. All right. Case studies are looking at a, an actual situation that may have occurred at your facility. Maybe, you, you know, you start out a training class on slip trip falls with the fact that uh, we had three recordable entries the previous year, and these people have had issues because of it. So you focus on case studies that have happened at your facility to drive it home that this can happen to you. If you haven't had that happen at your facility, then you look at similar facilities. I guarantee you can find case studies of other facilities that have had entries that pertain to the topic that you're teaching. Uh, I'll give you a good, uh, a good site. It's the FACE F-A-C-E, FACE program through NIOSH and CDC. FACE stands for Fatality Assessment uh, Control and Evaluation. And it's just a list of uh, fatalities that have occurred at various locations through the US and companies report that information and then they do an incident investigation on it on this website. And it's great for your incident investigation committee or great as a case, case study to start off a, a topic. Instruments, folks, an instrument is just a pretest, right? I don't wanna waste my time teaching on a topic if I know that these people have the knowledge, skills, and abilities already. I can give them a pretest and determine that they have that knowledge and then I can move on, all right? Because a lot of these standards don't require a certain amount uh, from everybody. Role playing. Role playing is a great uh, way to get employee involvement. People typically have fun doing it. It's exciting. They, they get involved, they get into it. Uh, we do in our train the trainer courses, we do you know what not to do during a mock OSHA inspection or a, an actual OSHA inspection. So we have a safety manager saying things they shouldn't say, uh, an overly talkative employee that shouldn't be saying things, and then a mean safety OSHA compliance officer that's uh, just write down all the horrible things. And it's fun and it's dynamic and, and people love to get involved with that, okay? <clears throat> games, games are excellent, excellent tools for reinforcement, for review, okay? Keep in mind that's for review. Uh, people don't like to play games on new information. They get frustrated and they get mad. But man, you talk about building up camaraderie between teams during your training and the competitiveness of these. Uh, there is a lady named Linda Tapp that writes a book called Safety Fundamentals that has 77 different safety related games. Uh, I use that for some of my training. And then film and video. Folks, film and video is great, but gone are the days that we put a 30 minute video in and leave the room and turn out the lights. That's a recipe for a snooze fest, okay? So keep that in mind. Videos should be maybe one to two minutes and maybe illustrate a point. So I embed videos in some of my PowerPoints that maybe we're talking about vapor density, the weight of a gas compared to air, and then I show a balloon or something like that. All right, so games are, I mean, I'm sorry, film and video is great, but don't 
rely on a film or video to completely cover a topic. And I know companies that still do that with forklift training and bloodborne pathogens and things like that. It's a big no-no. They say the average attention span is six to eight minutes for the average adult. Uh-oh, that means I lost you guys about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> but the truth is, long videos are not going to keep interest. And then finally, of course, hands-on, learn by doing. That's probably one of the best methods, especially for practical training, like confined space entry or lockout tag out or hazmat emergency response, that type of thing. Bottom line, guys, the key to effective training is variety. Uh, I've got uh, clients that have used me for the last 15 years. Doesn't mean that I'm the greatest in the world. This means I mix it up. And that might even be doing PowerPoints that have different colors or different backgrounds or new video or what's the latest that's happened at that facility. You've got to make your training more dynamic. Uh, and by the way, if you're using PowerPoints, which let's say mo most of us do, make sure they are visually appealing. Uh, I just came back from a, a conference where the trainer was excellent, dynamic trainer, and his PowerPoint was black and white words on a black and white background. Uh, big no-no. And the other rule is PowerPoints are not to be used as a reading of the entire PowerPoint. If you're putting full sentences on a PowerPoint, that's not the intended purpose. The PowerPoint is you designed to actually make you remember a point to talk about it. There's what we call a six by six rule. A six by six means uh, six, no more than six bullet points and six words per bullet point as a rule. Think about that when you're developing your PowerPoints. But again, the key to variety. And finally, you've got to incentivize participation. Now, I, we started this out by saying that adults uh, are learned differently than children, but I'm gonna tell you, adults still like to win. I like to win stuff. I like to win prizes. I like to win money. Whoever said money is not a good incentive, I'm not sure what they're talking about because we give out coins in our classes for people that make really good grades or they participate in the training and they make a, a really good point or a comment during the training class. So I don't care if it's a little prize, maybe it's a, a you know, a small, a tool or something like that. But the bottom line is you've got to recognize these employees so that they will continue to grow and you empower them with your training and through incentives like the things that we're talking about. And that's just a smaller picture of a larger, larger perspective, which is incentivizing employee participation through, uh, through safety. And you can't do that, folks, you cannot do that based on lack of injuries. Your incentive program needs to be proactive. And with that, I think it's a good segue to turn this over to Brent. Thanks, Eric, that was great information. Um, so yeah, as Eric mentioned, my name is Brent Lee and I'm with CA Short. And what we're gonna go over is taking the information that Eric provided and then pull it over into employee engagement. You know, after they receive that training, how to incentivize to keep that top of mind each and every day. So you'll hear from a lot of people that word engagement's thrown around. And just real quick, I'm, I'm just gonna take one second to read the definition. It says employee engagement is the extent to which employees feel passionate about their jobs, committed to the organization and put discretionary effort into their work. So from a state of the workplace point of view, right now, these are some pretty interesting numbers. There's 123 million full-time employees in the United States. Out of that 123 million, 33% are engaged, 51% are disengaged and 16% are actively disengaged. What does that really mean? Well, engaged employees, they're the ones that they're going to go above and beyond each and every day. They're going to show up early. They're going to work late. Um, they're going to be the first ones to raise their hands, to volunteer for a safety committee, uh, lead a toolbox talk, do that teaching aspect that Eric mentioned. You're not engaged employees. There's nothing wrong with those employees. They show up on time. They leave them, you know, when they're supposed to leave each and every day. But most likely they're not going to, you know, raise the hand and say, hey, I'll do this or volunteer for that. Um, and then you're actively disengaged employees. Those are the ones, unfortunately, that are toxic. Uh, anytime you implement change, for an example, they're the first ones that are going to complain. Uh, they're going to try to bring other employees down with them about um, 
why the change is not effective and why you shouldn't change, et cetera. So unfortunately with those, um, there's typically two outcomes. Uh, one of two is, you know, hopefully you bring them up to one of those other uh, quote engaged or not engaged categories, or you have to look at it from some perspective, um, should this employee be with us? You know, are they a good fit here at our organization? The one thing that we struggled with for years from our perspective, you know, implementing incentive programs is consistently anytime you're bringing in something that's going to cost money, your management executive C-suite team is going to say, hey, can we see an ROI around that? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, it used to be very hard to put an ROI around engagement. Um, that wasn't a hard number that was on paper, like a lost time accident, et cetera. But as we move forward now, C-suite executives see that, they're recognizing that, and these numbers prove it. You know, right now, 87% of C-suite executives recognize that disengaged or employees are among their biggest threats. 71% rank um, employee engagement as one of the most important issues they face in achieving success, and then 24% say their employees are engaged. That's a big discrepancy, 87% meaning, hey, we know we need to do this, but only 24% are engaged. So we're gonna talk a little bit over the next few minutes are what are some different things that you can do as an organization to get your employees more engaged in your safety culture after they go through that training. Before we jump right into that though, um, as Eric mentioned when he was finishing up his, everybody has certain views of, well, how does OSHA view safety incentive programs? Fortunately for me, I've been in this industry for 15 years, and I've seen a lot of different perspectives from safety directors, safety managers on how they view incentive programs. But when it comes to OSHA, OSHA does support safety incentive programs if they're properly structured. So I'm going to read a quick statement from OSHA, and then we'll kind of dissect this statement a little bit. But they say incentive programs that discourage employees from reporting their injuries are problematic because under Section 11C, an employer may not in any manner discriminate against an employee because the employee exercises a protected right, such as the right to report an injury. What are they saying? Well, fortunately for me, I get a lot of chances to take tours of facilities, job sites, et cetera. When several years ago, when we used to talk to safety directors, well, OSHA doesn't believe in safety incentive programs. Well, let me give you an example of what OSHA frowned upon. Um, I'm sure everybody that's on the webinar today has probably seen this or been a part of this, but for me, typically when I drove to a manufacturing facility, um, when you're pulling up to the front of the building, you'd see one of two things, you know, they would have big signs that would tell you how many days that facility had been without a lost time accident, or maybe they used one of the cool stoplights for different things that they were promoting. But the one thing that wasn't promoted typically out there with big it was in fine print, no big letters around this one was how the program worked. Typically with some of these safety incentive programs, the big giveaway or quote big ticket item, it was something really big that caught everybody's attention. Maybe it was a brand new truck, maybe it was a fishing boat, something that people saw out front with that signage. But what the fine print read on these safety incentive programs is if one person had a lost time accident, it disqualified every single person in that facility from having the opportunity and a chance to win that big ticket item. Had non-reporting written all over it. Uh, nobody wanted to be the first person to raise their hand or report an incident um, that affected three to 400 people in some cases that disqualified them. Those are the type of programs that OSHA frowned upon. What OSHA supports is a program that's properly structured, as I just mentioned. And what I mean by properly structured, it was just as Eric said, focusing on leading indicators versus lagging indicators, being proactive instead of being reactive. So building your program around Pacific KPIs, specifically around the individual, they're big advocates of, you know, for me too, if you're building an incentive program around safety, keep them based on the individual versus group goals. But if you can also put in some group goals, maybe around performance, quality metrics, et cetera, into your incentive program. So I'm gonna take a quick uh, second just to let Renee put a poll up here before we jump into building a successful incentive program, just to see how many people are currently doing one right now. Give everybody a couple seconds to go ahead and vote. It's 
not populating them on my side, Renee, so I can't see them. Ren, it'll just take a second longer, I think. Okay. There we go. Perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, okay, we got a good variety here uh, that we have some that are doing some already, some that are interested in possibly doing one down the road. So this is great. So hopefully, nonetheless, everybody will get a, a, some good information. I'm going to hit on both aspects. Maybe we can uh, give you some ideas to complement what you're already doing, or maybe uh, just to some ideas to start some new programs moving forward. So where does a safety incentive program fit? into a good safety culture. I think this graph paints a really good picture of that. I use the analogy all the time, any good successful safety incentive program is one piece of the pie, it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle, et cetera. What any good program should do is it should heighten the awareness around things you're already doing. Those things that, like Eric mentioned, your training, proper use of PPE, observations, it should have it where employees, it's top of mind each and every day when they show up for work. One of the things that we promote is we try to keep it simple. This is the foundation of a lot of our successful clients. The way we work with them on building a successful incentive program is these 10 elements. Um, we've got a book, it's called The Missing Link. Um, we'll share our contact information at the end of the presentation, but anybody that's interested in getting a copy of it, um, pretty quick read, 45 to 60 minutes. We'll be more than happy to share it with you. But a lot of these things are common sense. You're probably doing a lot of them now already. Um, I'm, and I'm not, we don't have the time today, obviously, for me to go through each and every one of these elements, but I will hit on two of them that I stress to my clients each and every day. Uh, the third one on the list there is short term recognition periods. I use the analogy all the time it's kind of like a vacation. Uh, vacation's two or three weeks away, you're ready to go. Um, it's constantly on your mind. If it's six to eight months away, um, Typically, six to eight months away, you're not going to think about it quite as much. It's not going to cross your mind as much. If you can apply that same analogy to your incentive program, it's proven to be more successful. And what I mean by that is if you have an annual budget per person for your incentive program, we're not asking you, I, I never tell clients, hey, to spend more money. But if you can take that and break it down so you're recognizing every 30 days versus once or twice a year, your program is going to be more effective. Also, number eight on the list there is family involvement. So one of our goals at CA Short when we work with clients is whatever message you're trying to get across at work each and every day is to help carry that message to the home, get the spouse involved, get the kids involved, get the grandparents involved. Now, a lot of our clients have different ways of doing that, but we do some simple things. We have a platform, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, called Safe Gagement, but we have tools that go hand in hand with our program. One of those is simply sending flyers, different types of information to the homes directly. It's human nature. People lace up on a coffee table, a nightstand. Hey, mom, dad, what is this? Well, if I do this and this at work, in our case, you can earn points. I can redeem those points for different things, whether it's uh, a Dewalt drill, an Apple product, a gift card, whatever that may be. So it gets them to start asking questions. I have some other clients that do non-monetary things. Some, some of you might do this already. They do a safety slogan contest. Let the kids at home draw a picture that depicts that particular slogan. They have an unbiased judge panel. At the end of the day, they develop a calendar on the top 12. Those calendars go home, they're on the fridge. So there's a lot of things that you can do to get the family involved. But at the end of the day, the goal is whatever message you're trying to get across at work, help carry that same message to the home. So as I mentioned a minute ago, what is safe gagement? Uh, if you look it up, you're not gonna find it out there. It's definitely proprietary, we made it up. Um, but safe gagement occurs when engaged employees are safer at work and make better decisions because they care about those they work with, the company they work for, and the overall accomplishments of the organization. Now there's five components of safe gagement. And I'm gonna cover each one of them fairly quickly here to be respectful of everyone's time, but not one is more important than the other. Now, the first one is leading indicators. Um, with leading indicators, I'm sure everyone on the webinar today obviously knows what a leading indicator is, but at the end of the day, a leading indicator is a pre-incident measurement versus a measurement that is collected after the incident already occurs. So some of the best practices for leading indicators, um, they need to be credible, they need to be predictive. 
Uh, one of the things that I'll stress as well with leading indicators is they need to be simple and well-defined. So anytime you're building an incentive program, your KPIs, your goals, they need to be black and white. You never want them to have a gray area there where it can promote favoritism. Some of the more effective leading indicators that you'll see here, I tried to do some that are maybe common across any type of vertical, whether it's reporting near misses, uh, participation in safety committees. And one thing that you'll see on the right, as I mentioned, our platform is a points platform. Uh, typically, most of our clients will assign a value to each one of their KPIs. And the neat thing about it is you're only issuing points out to the ones that are being proactive. So with that being said, people always ask me, hey, what's a typical budget for an effective program? Well, you take your hourly work rate, and you give them the opportunity to earn one extra hour of pay per month if they hit all your proactive goals. So again, it puts the involvement on them in their participation level. But one thing when you do any good incentive program, you've got to capture that ROI. And with the safe engagement platform we have, not only can we help with capturing historical data aspect of it, but also making some predictive trends. That way you can build your own modules. You can compare from a corporate perspective to maybe by location and all the way drill it down to departments as well. The next one is comprehensive training. Now, obviously this goes directly hand in hand with what Eric went over as well, but it's gotta be part of the incentive program as well. Um, as Eric mentioned, you know, comprehensive training is to make sure everyone understands your safety culture. Now, in regards to your incentive program, one of the things that I'll just kind of piggyback on is what Eric already said, as he mentioned, everybody learns differently. Uh, one thing that I'll throw out there now is a lot of my clients, I see them doing mentoring programs, uh, quote, they're champions, you know, they're mentoring their new hires day one. They know those individuals have good habits. They want them to, you know, put those habits onto those new hires instantly. Right now, millennials, millennials make up one in three workers in America. And millennials, of course, are those that are ages between 18 to 34. They've been immersed in technology their entire life. So they learn differently than probably myself does. So with millennials, that's one thing that we do with our platform also, not to replace an LMS system, but you can upload your own video content and it gives you the opportunity to attach quizzes to it as well. So it can be a little more hands-on with that. Um, pretty simple. They can download an app with our platform and go right on there and take a quiz, create it on a pass-fail percentage basis as well. The third component is positive reinforcement. Now, before I get into positive reinforcement, just to put simply what it is, is it's the practice of basically rewarding a behavior in order to strengthen that behavior again. I'll say this, and I like to use examples all the time. We certainly understand there's consequences when people do not follow certain safety policies. There has to be. But I'm going to give you a quick example of how I've seen positive reinforcement be effective. Uh, one of my clients, they had a lot of issues with forklift drivers not beeping in a blind spot. Um, he had written up some. He had preached it in safety meetings. The point wasn't getting across. Well, one day he stood unannounced in an area where People actually could not see him, that he was there. And he watched and observed for about an hour or two hours as the drivers came through this particular blind spot. What he did at the end of the day, he took note of who was beeping versus who wasn't. Had a safety meeting at the end of the day. He rewarded everyone that actually did do what they were supposed to in front of their peers. Now, he rewarded them something simple. We have a uh, safety on the spot award with our safe engagement platform. It allows them to go in and actually select something that they would want. Um, again, whether it's a, a name brand product, gift card, et cetera. But the point of that is, is that two weeks later, he went back again, observed without everyone knowing, and the percentage of drivers greatly increased of who was beeping. So his point got across. He took a little different approach. Again, we understand that that doesn't work in each and every situation, but in this case, it was very effective for positive reinforcement. The fourth one is parallel engagement. Uh, parallel engagement basically is everyone is on board from top to bottom in line with your safety culture. Quick example of that is most of my clients, anywhere I go, they give me tours of the facility. In this case, three things we had to wear, vest, glasses, earplugs. 
as we were walking through, safety director was giving me a great tour. We were kind of telling me how things worked, et cetera, but he kept staring at a group of people. Well, in this case, he stopped and said, just give me a few minutes, I'll be right back, hold tight. What was going on evidently was the VP of sales was given a tour of the facility to a prospective new customer. Well, they only had on safety glasses at that point. They did not have a vest or earplugs. He went and grabbed them one, took them over there, and he came back, he said, yeah, hopefully that doesn't cause any confrontation. I'm sure that's probably a little embarrassing, but he said, there's no way I can come out here each and every day and tell everyone that works on this plant floor, hey, you can't put your earplugs around your neck. You can't put your glasses on top of your head. You've got to do it the right way. And then they see someone from the executive team not doing it, does not send the right message. Fortunately, spoke with him about a month later. They won the business from that customer. And one of the things that customer valued was their commitment to safety. So parallel engagement has got to be practiced from top to bottom. Last but not least, as we wrap it up, is connectivity and ownership. Now, what connectivity and ownership is, is when everyone in your organization is, feels empowered, basically. They feel empowered that their voice can be heard and that someone's going to actively listen to their voice, specifically when it comes to an ownership of an incentive program. As Eric mentioned, they're the ones out there doing the job each and every day. They're on the floor. Um, they're going to have a lot of opinions, and typically their opinions matter because they're doing that particular task each and every day. And this one's a great example, in my opinion. One of my clients, they're in the cement concrete business, and they were having many struggles with back-related issues. As a management executive team, they had, they had done a lot of things. They had changed, but still, they weren't getting that reduction that they wanted. So on the platform, they put it out there, hey, anyone has any suggestions on how we could reduce back-related injuries, we're wide open. Well, they got a lot of them, but one really stood out was an employee that had been there for a long time said, I really think we need a fit for duty test. I've been here many years and I can tell you some of the people are not physically fit to do what's being asked of them. Light bulb went off, that made a lot of sense to everyone. So they partnered with their legal team um, obviously with some physicians as well, and they built a fit for duty test. Well, lo and behold, back-related injuries started going down after they started implementing that. Now, they rewarded that employee handsomely. Obviously, he saved the company a lot of money, but the main thing about that is that that employee, number one, felt empowered to give his opinion, and number two, the company was open enough to listen and value that feedback that they were receiving from their employees. So as I said at the beginning, you know, not one of these elements is more important than the other, but it has proven to be effective. If you can incorporate each and every one of these into your incentive program, it is going to be more successful. So with that being said, I just wanna share two slides real quick. When I share these numbers, I always lead with, we were one piece of the pie again, remember one piece of the puzzle. In this case, KCP and L, they were doing a lot of different things. We feel like hopefully we were a part of this, but this was not just due to the incentive program. We hopefully heightened the awareness around everything else they were doing. So they had a target rate of reducing their OSHA incidents by 10%, see 39% there. Reduced the DART rate by 10, 46%, so awesome numbers. And this is just a little quote from one of our clients, um, Cisco here, it says, sometimes it renders people speechless when you say that you've turned your retention around by 83% and reduced your incidents and accidents by 43%. So again, for us, we feel like we were part of their team. They were doing a lot of other things there as well. Last but not least here, for anybody that's not familiar with Gallup, they're an American-based research company. Um, and this particular one here, this is 5,000 companies the top 25% versus the bottom 25% that they pull. Now, these are your top 25% of engaged companies versus your bottom 25% that are not engaged or actively disengaged. Over on the left, 64% fewer safety incidents, 81% reduced absenteeism. On the right, you got your higher quality, your higher probability. But on the bottom, the one that stands out to me is the bottom right of this slide. Active disengagement is costing companies 500 to 750 million annually. 
That's a crazy number. You break that down, that's over a billion dollars a day that disengaged employees are costing organizations out there. So with that being said, I really appreciate everyone's time. I know we're running at the top of the hour right now, but um, for us at CA Short, we would welcome the opportunity at any point. I know a lot of you guys said you were looking for incentive programs or some that you're doing. If we've struck any new ideas or interest to you, please do reach out to us. We'd welcome the opportunity to learn what you're doing now. Maybe we could complement it or generate some new ideas. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Eric for a minute. I know he's got something that he wants to promote as well with his classes. Thanks, Brent. And uh, thank you everyone for taking the time. And I was just gonna let you know that uh, we do have a certified safety manager course uh, coming up. That is a train the trainer course that meets those 490.1 uh, requirements. So we've got that February 7th through the 11th uh, in Las Vegas even. Yay. So if you're interested, uh, we will also run a special for those that have attended the meeting. Uh, use that coupon code that you see. Uh, that's a over $400 savings there. Uh, we'd love to see you out there. Uh, we ho hold this CSM course online, but I, I'm old school. I like getting people in class and, and getting that uh, the, the team approach that, you know, we spend a day on how to train, which we cover in at about 20, 25 minutes here. So uh, please give us a, a call or let us know if we can help you and, uh, you know, see you in Las Vegas. All right, everyone, we are right at the top of the hour. So we are pushing our time limit today, but we're so excited that you guys joined us. What we will do after the presentation, we'll clean it up. We'll get you a copy of the Prezo, also a copy of the video of the webinar, and we'll include some questions and answers that we actually did receive some questions during the show. We'll actually put those in email format for you so you can get those responses as well. So thank you again for joining us for our live webinar today. Have a great afternoon. And thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon.